Welcome to episode 167 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time I'm going to talk about Gary Bartz's album from 1971 that he did with his group Two Troop. And with Two Troop, he did two albums called Harlem Bush Music. One was called Taifa, and the other one here is Uhuru. They were originally supposed to be a double album, but Milestone, the label, decided they wanted to put them out both as single albums, which I guess is a label's prerogative. Anyway, this is the second of the two, but it's all part of the same piece of music. What do we expect from this? Well, it's really approaching peak 1970 in terms of the great flowering of black jazz at the time. It's funky, it's soulful, it's experimental, and it's also a record which gives you a real sense that the musicians had a genuine connection with the community surrounding them, not just the frustrations and struggles of that community, but also its possibilities. Gary Bartz was born in 1940 in Baltimore. He was interested in music from a very early age. At age six, he heard Charlie Parker playing sax on the radio during the very early days of the bebop movement, was amazed by the sound, had no idea what it was, his parents told him it was a saxophone, and he pestered them for the next five years until eventually, at age 11, he got given his first saxophone. Growing up, he had a good home life. His parents were very supportive of his musical career, but he was also very heavily affected by the racist attitudes in the city surrounding him. At age 17, he headed off to New York City to go to Juilliard to study music. He quickly got involved in the amazing jazz scene. Really, what a time to arrive in New York and be a jazz musician in 1958. And young cats like him and Tony Williams, who also was too young, far too young to be going to clubs, would sneak in all kinds of different ways to hear their idols. They would pretend to be roadies. In Williams' case, he would put on a false mustache and so on. Anyway, Bart's got to hear all kinds of great music in those first few years. He was still pretty young at this point. His parents, of course, had a nightclub in Baltimore, and at that nightclub previously, he had met people like Abby Lincoln and Max Roach, who were now a couple at this point, and Roach and Lincoln began to look out for Gary and have him over for dinner and so on when he was only in his late teens, basically looked out for him in the big city. As the decade turned over into the 1960s, that in loco parentis function for Roach and Lincoln turned over into becoming a sideman role for Bart's in their group. Gary had a growing reputation helped by some of these associations and, of course, by his training at Juilliard. And in 1962 to 1964, his first major engagement, long-standing membership of the group, was with Charles Mingus's Jazz Workshop. And there he rubbed shoulders with two future collaborators of Coltrane, McCoy Tyner and Eric Dolphy, as well as Rasan Roland Kirk, that amazing multi-instrumentalist. In this time, he gets a reputation in New York as one of the best alto sax players around. In 1965, the great drummer Art Blakey and his group played his parents' club in Baltimore, and it turned out that his saxophonist, John Gilmore, was leaving the band. So Bart's his dad phones him up and says, look, get down here. He's looking for a sax player. Gary comes down, sits in on the gig, and from that point on is a member of Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. In 1968, Gary spent a little bit of time playing with his old bandmate from the Jazz Workshop era, McCoy Tyner, who of course now had his own band after the death of John Coltrane. Although Bartz's own interactions with Coltrane were limited, he absolutely worshipped the guy, which is not unusual for any sax player in New York in the 1960s. Not just because of his playing, but also because of his deep and abiding spirituality. And in fact, Bartz is on record as saying there's only two people he's ever met who really had a Christ-like feel or aura to them, and those were Malcolm X and John Coltrane. That same year, after many years of being an increasingly high-profile sideman, Bartz is signed by Milestone Records, and he puts out his debut, Libra, that year, followed by Another Earth in 1969. These are both well-regarded and relatively influential records, but the sales were not particularly great. They're also notable for some of the excellent sidemen he had working with him at the time, including Pharaoh Sanders, Charles Tolliver, and Reggie Workman. In 1970, adding another piece to that whole pattern of playing with a lot of people who had played with Coltrane at different points, he joins Miles Davis's band. He played a lot in the clubs with Miles, didn't do a lot of dedicated studio work, although Miles' studio work at the time was a bit odd because it was all about snippets of tapes and assemblage and so on. But he does appear in Miles' Live Evil album, which comes out in 1971. But increasingly, at this time, Bartz is really entering the 70s in a mindset where he really has a statement that he wants to make. And so he forms this group called the In Two Troop in 1970. This group, of course, is heavily influenced at the time philosophically by the burgeoning black power movement. It played funk, jazz, soul, there's African folk, there's avant-garde, it's a whole fusion of different kinds of things, although I wouldn't actually call it jazz fusion as such, it's just a blending. As Bart describes it, Ntu is a suffix from the Bantu language in Africa. The suffix encompassed all of the arts of whatever the philosophies that you had were. We wanted a band that could perform anywhere, to go out in the middle of the jungle and perform, so that would mean no microphones, all acoustic, involving the crowd, and in fact the Ntu troupe would often encourage the audience to bring their own instruments like cowbells, tambourines, harmonicas, and so on, and play along with the group at the time. There's a debut album for the Intu Troupe called Home, which is a live recording, just as the concept of coming together with a very different lineup than on this particular record. 
That album home has Bartz, Woody Shaw, Rashid Ali, Bob Cunningham, and Albert Daly. But as the concept for the group evolves and Bartz begins to plan the Harlem Bush music set of two albums, he shakes up the lineup and heads into the studio. Lyrically and philosophically, this is very much a record of its time. If you can think about the degree of optimism that there was around the civil rights movement in the middle part of the 1960s and how that optimism was completely crushed by the assassinations of Malcolm X, of Martin Luther King, and the general realization that the white majority was not going to give up power or influence or any sense of equality without a struggle, black activists began to put much less face in liberal democratic forms and much more focus on the community itself and what its own potential was. This, of course, too, was a time of the Vietnam War where young black men were heavily overrepresented relative to their percentage of the population and who was being drafted into the war going over there to Vietnam fighting and dying. Bartz had already lost a lot of friends, and so with this record, he's trying to make a connection to the community, which is looking into itself and experiencing this moment of self-determination, but also very clearly aligning with the opposition to the war and opposition to the suffering it was causing. This record was produced by Oren Keep News, Milestone Records' Mr. Everything, and it was engineered by Elvin Campbell. The lineup includes Bartz on alto saxophone, soprano saxophone, piano and vocals, Junie Booth on acoustic bass, Ron Carter on both acoustic and electric bass, Harold White on drums, Nat Bettis on percussion, and Andy Bay on vocals. Originally, Bartz had wanted Leon Thomas, who was a friend of his, but of course, Thomas had just famously done some work very much along the same lines with Pharaoh Sanders, providing vocals, on, for instance, on Sanders' record Karma, which of course is so iconic and so recognizable. Bartz is very sensitive about seeming to be copying that, and to use Leon Thomas was probably a step too far, so he reached out to another friend of his, Andy Bay. Side one is entirely comprised of one track, Blue, a folktale, which is really kind of an amazing track and goes through all kinds of different textures and feels and contributions and just grips your attention the whole way through. It's notable too because in addition to Andy Bay, who really is a great singer, Gary does a lot of singing himself and he's not a great singer, just to be clear, he's a very ordinary singer, but somehow the unvarnished nature of the vocals just seems to fit. Gary starts with a simple riff on piano, which he then doubles on vocals, and the lyrics are very much kind of a... I guess, a poetic epitaph for the 60s, all the promise that it had for black people and then giving way to this bitter reality they were living now. Then you get this funky rhythm developing around the same riff, first of all with Gary on alto and then the rest of the band kicks in. And then a kind of call and answer section emerges on the vocals between Bartz and Bay. Bay has this rich, beautiful, soulful voice and you can see why Bartz ultimately was so happy that he chose him for this record. As I mentioned, musically the piece is kind of fascinating because it starts off as a, kind of a jazz funk piece with maybe even some nods to spiritual jazz and, and even almost poetry. But by the time you get about two thirds of the way through, it's a 12 bar blues, like full out, and totally driven by Ron Carter's great walking bass line. Side two starts with Uhuru Sasa. Now we're right into the funk. The song is all about resisting white control, not going to Vietnam, not being domestic servants, not taking any more of that shit. Musically, the whole band locks into this really wicked groove and Bars does some amazing soloing over top. Second song on side two is quite a famous song in retrospect, or had a degree of fame at the time anyway, which is Viet Cong, which is the only song that I'm aware of that was written by a guy called Hakim Jemmy, who was a bass player at times for Sun Ra. The lyrics are brilliantly delivered by Bay, and there's a wonderful contained solo by Gary in the song. Celestial Blues has this great lyric from Bay about a greater universal consciousness in one channel. Bart's totally killing it in the other. The final song, and a second consecutive song with a celestial theme, to close out the album is The Planets. Lots of great performances here, but Ron Carter is really the center of this song, I think, certainly following the early verses, and his walking bass line just continually drabs your attention. As an album, this is very characteristic of its time in a number of ways. First, it's part of this culmination around 1970 of black musicians really finally taking back full control, creative control of their music from what was a white-controlled music industry. Secondly, it's a highly community-focused record. It's got a democratic and collective feel, which lines up very much with the black community's focus on itself in the 1970s. More recently, Bart said that he'd been told that every Black Panther family had this album, which is something which made him quite proud. Musically, it's funky, it's spiritual, it's clear-headed, and it's enjoyable right the way through. It's a key entry in all that great music associated with the Black Power era of the late 60s and early 1970s, and for me, it's four and a half out of five stars.